After spending way too many hours playing Pokemon Sword and Shield, I finally managed to complete the Pokedex by catching all 400 of the Pokemon available in this new generation, which means it is time for things I wish I knew earlier in Pokemon Sword and Shield. So without wasting any more time, let's jump straight into it. One of the tips you've probably figured out for yourself or seen someone on the internet by now is the fact that you can change the day-night cycle by going into your system settings on the Switch, and if you change it to any time past 8pm, it'll actually change the in-game time also to night time, which can be useful for certain Pokemon that need to evolve at night time, such as Eevee into Umbreon. As a side note, during most of the game, the day-night cycle will only take place in the wild area. In the routes and the towns, the day-night cycle will only take effect after you have finished the main storyline. But related to this feature, there's actually something way more useful, and that is going to be the weather system. There is a way in Pokemon Sword and Shield to change the weather condition in the entire wild area to whichever you need. And this can be very useful because certain Pokemon only spawn during certain weather conditions in certain regions. The way this works is going into the system settings and changing the date. And there's going to be specific days for specific weather conditions. So for example, if we change it to the first day of May in 2020, it will always be clear sky, normal weather all over the wild area. Then for example, if we need it to be cloudy, overcast weather, we simply change it to the 1st of March of 2020. I will leave a chart here on screen if you want to take a screenshot of it, so you can save it onto your desktop and always have this handy. But essentially all of the weathers are always the first day of a specific month in the year 2020. Another important side note is that the normal weather, the intense sun, the overcast, rain, thunderstorm and snow are all going to be available from the beginning of the game. However, the snowstorm and the sandstorm are only available after you get around the halfway point in the storyline. And then finally, the foggy weather you won't be able to activate until after you've already finished the story. Also, quick disclaimer, I've seen certain people complaining of getting like soft locks for changing the weather and date too much in their game, saying that it makes it so certain rare Pokemon don't spawn for a little while because of this. But for me personally, this has never been an issue. I've never had any trouble with this and I've been abusing this mechanic to complete my Pokedex as soon as possible. And like I said, it's never been a problem. But I just wanted to warn you guys as there are some people complaining that this may be a thing. Moving on, because of the camp system in this game, berries become even more so important than in some of the previous installments. And considering that the trees take a little bit of time to replenish their berries, we want to make sure we're getting the max amount of each time we shake the trees. But as we know, if we overshake the trees too many times, a Pokemon will fall out, initiating the battle, and it'll also steal half of the berries that previously fell on the floor. Now the way to avoid this is that you can actually tell when you have shaken the tree too much, and when the next shake is going to provoke you to start a Pokemon battle. After every time you shake the tree, just stop and chill for a few seconds, and notice how the tree shakes. If it shakes in pretty consistent, slow patterns, it means you're safe to shake it again. Do this every time you shake the tree and just wait a little bit, and soon you notice that it starts moving more sporadically and less consistently. This means that the next time you shake that tree, a Pokemon is going to fall out, stealing half of your berries. So this is a very nice way to make sure you're getting the max amount of berries out of each tree. Now let's talk a little bit about EVs in Pokemon Sword and Shield. Don't worry, this isn't going to be a boring, in-depth, competitive guide of EV training. I may make a separate one of those in the future if you guys are interested, but just in case you have never heard of EVs, just to get you up to speed, EVs stand for effort values, and the basic general idea of how they work is that each specific Pokemon has a specific EV it gives out when defeated. This can be either special attack, HP, special defense, etc, etc. So for EV training, let's say you wanted your Pokemon to have the maximum amount of speed possible, you'd only allow it to defeat Pokemon that grant speed EVs. And if you're just a casual player not really interested in the competitive side of Pokemon, you can play through the entire franchise and not even know these really even exist. And it wouldn't really affect you in the slightest. However, if you are interested on in checking out how your EVs are doing on your Pokemon, you can go into the summary and then on the second tab where it shows all of its stats, Simply press the X button and here you'll be able to see the progress of your EV training on that Pokemon. Now, for those of you who have been into EV training before, Pokemon Sword and Shield makes your job a lot easier. It used to be a very, very tedious task to get perfect EVs on any of your Pokemon. However, in this latest generation, they have made things way easier to make it more accessible to everybody. As most of you know, you've always been able to buy vitamins such as protein, iron, calcium and stuff like that to increase EV points in specific stats without actually having to manually EV train. Each one of these will increase 10 points into that stat. And usually in the previous Pokemon games, you're just limited to be able to use only 10 of these at a time on a specific Pokemon. Which means you still had to do some manual EV training, this just shortened the process a bit. However, in Pokemon Sword and Shield, you can actually use as many of these vitamins as you wish. Obviously until you hit the max EVs per stat or per total. And while this can be pretty expensive, whether you do it through battle points or actual through in-game currency, it is still, I would say, less tedious than manually training. 
However, if you are going to take the classic route of EV training manually, take into account that if you go to the Battle Points shop, which is the woman here in the Poker Center at Hammerlock, she will sell some pretty cool items, such as the Power Bracer, Power Belt, Power Lens, Power Band, Power Anklet, and Power Weight. These are very good items to speed up the process of EV training specific stats onto your Pokemon, though it does lower their speed while they have them equipped. And then of course, probably the most important one is the Macho Brace. For a mere 10 battle points, what it does is that while this item is equipped onto your Pokemon, it'll get double the amount of EV points all the time. This will double the amount of EV points you get, but not only from battles, also from the Pokemon jobs you can do from the Poke Centers. Which quick side note, if you've never done any of the Poke jobs, you can send your Pokemon off on a job for 24 hours. This is also another new way of EV training up your Pokemon. Anyway, let's not get too carried away with EV training in this video. Like I said, we'll probably leave that for another day, as most of you probably aren't even interested too much in it, and it's also a little bit more advanced. Now, I'm sure, like myself, 99% of you have probably realized you can actually upgrade your bike on this game. Like, I remember I talked to this NPC right at the start of the game and seen the options, but there was so much going on at the start that I kind of just put it to the side and completely forgot about it. But there are NPCs around the wild area, such as the one just here outside the meetup point, where well, that if you speak to him, you can upgrade your bike. You can upgrade your bike up to a total of three times, which will cost you watts, each time a little bit more expensive. And for whatever reason, I didn't really start doing this until after I'd already completed the game and almost completed the actual entire Pokedex. And what this does is, as you'll notice, when you're riding your bike, occasionally you'll get this electric charge around you, which will allow you to hold the B button down, giving a bit of a speed boost to your bike for a short period of time. By upgrading your bike, it'll allow this speed boost to recharge a lot, lot quicker, allowing you to get from point A to point B more efficiently and a lot quicker. Which, by the way, don't try to waste too much time farming watts before you get to the end of the game. If you do come across them while you're progressing through the game, of course, definitely collect the watts as they can be useful early on as well for stuff like getting evolution stones from the Dig and Duo, getting the fossils, upgrading your bike, purchasing more moves for your Pokemon as well. There's many uses for the watts, but what I'm saying is don't waste time specifically farming watts too much in early game. The reason for this is that once you're in post-game and have already defeated the champion, farming watts becomes exceptionally easier as even the empty dens grant you 200 watts, and then the dens with raids in them actually give you 2,000 watts a time. So it makes it kind of farming watts before post-game becomes pretty much completely obsolete. Unless there's something you specifically need before post-game, then in that case, go ahead and get the amount of watts you need. In all of these tips and tricks videos, I always got out of my way to put at least one in. That is kind of one of those embarrassing things that I didn't realize until way too late into the game. And I'm sure most people probably did, but just in case you are like me and overlook very, very obvious signs on screen, if you are trying to effectively catch them all, as they say, there's something that's going to speed up your process a lot, which is when you're in the battle screen, instead of going into your bag and selecting your Pokeball you wish to throw at the enemy, you can actually just straight up press the X button, which it says right here above your moves, and go straight into your Pokeball menu and throw them straight from here, which over the course of catching all 400 Pokemon, saves you a lot of time, and yeah I know it literally tells you right here on the screen every single battle, but for some reason I just didn't notice until pretty late in. So yeah, there you have it, at risk of looking like a bit of an idiot. I just hope it helps at least one of you guys out there who probably didn't also notice this. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about the eggs and breeding system in Pokemon Sword and Shield. There are actually two nurseries in this game, one is in Route 5 and one is in Bridge Lake in the wild area. The way the nurseries work on this game is that you can leave two Pokemon there. In this, they won't gain levels like they did in some of the previous daycares on the other games, but if you leave a male and a female Pokemon of the same egg group here together, over time they will lay eggs, meaning you get infinite of whatever the female Pokemon was that you left behind. If you don't want to waste time finding out what egg group each Pokemon is and finding a compatible one, you can simply use a Ditto. Ditto is compatible to make eggs with any single Pokemon in the game. Even if it's a male Pokemon, you can leave, for example, a male Eevee with a Ditto, and it will still lay Eevee eggs, which is really, really useful. But there are a few extra things I would like to share with you guys about the egg system in this game. The first thing is, once you're in post-game, you want to go back to Sir Chester. Here we want to go to the hotel on the left-hand side and go in this door in the upper floor we can see right here. If we have a battle with this NPC, which by the way is pretty powerful, once you defeat him, you'll get an item called the Oval Charm. Once you hold the Oval Charm, it'll make it so your Pokemon lay eggs at a quicker rate which if you're trying to hatch many, many eggs of the same type to get a shiny, for example, or maybe like me, you want a full team of evolutions, it becomes pretty helpful. But that's not the only thing we can do to speed up the egg process. By having a Pokemon in your team with the ability called Flame Body, at the same time as having your egg in the party, it'll make it so the egg requires less steps to be able to hatch, just because the logic of the warmth of the Flame Body ability makes it so the egg hatches quicker. 
A Pokemon with the Flame Body ability that you can get pretty early would be Karko, for example, which you can find in the Gala Mines. With both of these things combined, you can get and hatch your eggs really, really quickly in this game. Now on the topic, I'm sure many of you have heard about a thing called the Masuda Method. Well, a very quick and general explanation of what the Masuda Method actually consists of, it's that if one of the Pokemon you left behind at the daycare center to lay eggs, is from a different region, and by region I mean real life different country, different language. So let's say you live in the US and leave your EV here at the daycare center. And then you get a friend from let's say Spain or Japan to send you a Dito from their country. If you leave this Spanish Dito, for example, with your American EV at the daycare center, it boosts up the chances by quite a high rate of the Pokemon that comes out of that egg being a shiny Pokemon. Quick bonus tip, if you spin around the analog stick really fast, you get the dance slash pose going on, which is kind of cool. Interesting fact that Milsery actually requires this pose to be able to evolve into Alchemy. Anyway, this video is getting pretty long, but before we do end this, I do want to leave you guys with a quick tip to get some cash in post-game. This is mainly used if you are going for all 400 Pokemon, you're going to find yourself needing more cash to get more quick balls, more ultra balls, and stuff like that. And without doing any tedious farming methods, this pretty much got me all the way through the game. It's not the fastest way of getting in-game currency in the game, but it is a really nice way of getting as much as you need. So what I do every time I'm out of cash and need to inevitably buy more Pokeballs to catch the rest of the Pokemon, is like we mentioned before, we're going to have loads of Watts in post-game, because the dens give out so much once we've finished the story, is we can either find the fishing lady that's occasionally around the wild area, and for some Watts she will usually bring up stuff like pearls, which we can sell for a decent amount of cash, and then personally, the thing I've been doing the most is simply go to the Dig and Duo Brothers, ask the brother on the right to dig up items for 500 watts. And between the Stardust, the Fossils, the Rare Bones, the Evolution Stones, stuff like this, which you can all just sell back at the Poke Center, you're going to get a decent amount of cash each time just to be able to continue catching your Pokemon. As usual, guys, it is very heavily encouraged for you guys to leave any tips and tricks in the comments down below that you think other Pokemon trainers could benefit from. So I hope you did find this video helpful, guys. If you did, don't forget to thumbs up button, subscribe for more content coming very soon, and we'll see you next time.